Good evening. I'm Ariana Cohen Halberstam. I'm the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to our 32nd annual festival. I'm so glad to be presenting They Ain't Ready for Me Tonight. This is a film that I saw months and months ago and has stuck with me since then. Um, and I've talked about it a lot. I want to thank our partner on tonight's program, Roxbury International Film Festival. It is now my pleasure to welcome the filmmaker, the director of tonight's film, Brad Rothschild, and somebody who you will all recognize from this film, the founder of Mask and the subject of the film, Tamar Manasseh. Welcome. Thank you. So, I will. You're on this mute. film. Am I now unmuted? You, you yes. Are. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for being here and, you know, and for sharing your story through this film. I want to start by asking how this film came to be. Um, Brad, how did you meet Tamar? So it was uh, about four years ago. It was October of 2016. I was reading uh, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency online, the JTA. There was an article and the headline of the article was Black rabbinical student leads army of moms on south side of Chicago. So I was uh, intrigued by that headline and I decided to take a closer look. And at the top of the article, there was a picture of this striking woman named Tamar Manasseh. And I started reading about the work that she was doing to prevent gun violence on the south side of Chicago and the organization that she created called MASK, Mothers and Men Against Senseless Killings. And it was a really compelling uh, piece. And the, the thing that I found most interesting was that Tamar credited her Judaism for her activism. And as I read this, I thought to myself, I wanna, I wanna talk to her and I wanna make a film about her. So I reached out to her, you know, a bunch of different ways on social media and through her organization's website. I sent her an email and I introduced myself as a filmmaker living in New York City. And I wrote that I think you would make a really great subject for a film. And, you know, what do you think? And she, she didn't immediately write back. So it took a while. There was a lot of, there were some unanswered messages. And finally, I got a, an email back from her and she wrote, thank you for your interest. I think my life is about as interesting as watching the paint dry. So I don't think I'm gonna participate in a film with you, but thank you. And I wrote back and I said, with all due respect, I disagree. And I would hope that you would reconsider. So she didn't, shut me down completely. She left the door open just enough that I continued to, uh, to pursue a project with her. And I, at one point I wrote to her, I said, if it's okay with you in a very non-threatening way, I'm going to continue to stalk you about this. <laughs> and she wrote back, okay. And that was kind of all I needed. And we talked on the phone, a couple of times and each time I was just blown away even more than before and I was totally committed to getting her to agree to make this film and then one day uh, she sent me a message on Facebook and she said I'm in Staten Island I can meet you now if you want to meet me so for the audience I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and Staten Island, while it is part of New York City, technically, it's nowhere near where I live. So I, I wrote back immediately. I said, give me two hours and I'll be there. And I dropped what I was doing and I drove out to Staten Island and I met with Tamar. Uh, and at the end of a long conversation, she kind of shrugged her shoulders and she said, I guess if you want to make this film, we could do it this summer. And that was how we went about making the film. We're not really introduced to your Judaism until a few, a few chapters into the film, I would say. Um, and yet there's so many beautiful things you say about how your Judaism brings you to the streets. I, I loved when there were the scenes in the synagogue where you said, 
this was my old block. Um, was it, was, can you talk about like sort of the, the Jewish path that brought you there and, and sort of the way you began to see these, the out, the block as synagogue and the synagogue as block and when those sort of spoke to each other? The block is where I'm from. I'm from the block. I'm from Inglewood in Chicago. So the block has always been in me. And so has the synagogue. I can never be, I can't ever remember being one without the other. I can't ever remember just being black and not being Jewish at the same time. I mean, like, this is what I've always done. I've always been Jewish and I've always been from the hood. So either I'm, I've always been from a block. So it's kind of like, they always work together for me. I mean, I was a kid who grew up going to Jewish day school in one of the most wealthy communities in Chicago, but I lived in the poorest. So it's always been like that for me. Both have always coexisted inside of me and in my life all day, every day. And it's kind of like, you don't come into the chapters about my Judaism. You see it, you come into that late. That's the first thing you get to. The fact that I'm on that corner is the most Jewish thing in the world. So it's not, that's the first thing I lead with my Judaism. And it's kind of like, that's not what most black people do. And it's not what most Jews do. It's just what my Judaism motivates. This is what my Judaism looks like. So my Judaism doesn't look like the synagogue that I was in in that movie anymore. It looks like the synagogue that I've created on the corner. That's mm -hmm. what it looks like. Yeah, I, I meant sort of in terms of the structure of the film, but I, mm -hmm. but I, and I, I really love the thing you said about Lech Lecha and the, and the idea of, you know, take, what are you going to do when you leave your father's house and how do you take it with you? And I think you're, you demonstrate the, the lived Jewish, your lived Jewishness really beautifully in the film. Um, I, I, Rabbi Funye actually is in another film that we're showing in the festival. Um, Share legacies. That's right, which we're yes. talking about on, yes, on Saturday. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> we're, I'm sure many festivals you visited are showing both films. They both came out. Around. No, he and I, he and I have talked about it. We kid each other about this all the time, all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious what what's happened with your rabbinical journey since the film. Well, my they actually offered me smicha, and oh. I was actually supposed to be ordained December 12th. But COVID had other ideas. And since I want to make sure that I keep my friends and my family and my community safe, I, we decided to postpone it until um, things kind of get a little bit better, until they start to improve. Because everything in Chicago, we just went back to another stay at home order today. So everything's closed in Chicago, including houses of worship. So, so much for that for right now, but it's happening. So how is, how is the lockdown and affected your work with mask um it's kicked it up 10 levels it's just i don't think we've ever been this busy before we were i mean summer was our season but now we're out year round um in the movie you see a vacant lot it's a school there now we actually built a school out of shipping containers and so jermaine the kid that you're introduced to in the movie we sent him to trade school he learned how to build stuff and he came back and we were building a trade school for other young people in the neighborhood like him who needed access to, to opportunity. So we were going to do a trade school with adult learning and GEDs and all of that good stuff. And then COVID happened. And, you know, I had this space for older kids. And my cousin says to me, you built, you built an ark and it's raining, Noah. You need to open up and let the kids in. And the day that everybody else, when the country shut down, I think it was March 17th, that was our first day of school there. So with us being in the neighborhood where there are so many really poor, like working poor people and so many essential workers, the really badly paid essential workers, the, the Instacart shoppers, the Grubhub delivery guys, the people who stock the shelves at the supermarkets and the drugstores, um, a lot of those people live in the neighborhood and they were faced with the choice of leaving their small children, leaving their children at home alone unattended or keeping their jobs. That's an impossible decision, impossible choice. And so what we wanted to do is kind of alleviate some of the pressure for those parents. So we opened every day and we did e-learning with their kids. We made sure they had adult supervision. We 
feed them, we fed them every day, all of that. And just to help these parents out. So we did that from March till June. Then in June, we started an online remote tutoring program where anybody from anywhere in the world can sign up to tutor a kid that's doing e-learning. But um, September 10th, when school first started back, we went right back into the classroom and we've been in the classroom every day since. So every day, we probably have about anywhere between 15 and 20 kids in our classrooms every single day. They get breakfast, they get hot lunch, they get supervision, they get tutoring, they get one-on-one -on -one attention every day. So lockdowns for other people, poor people can't be locked down because how do we survive that? And poor people have children and somebody has to be there to take care of those children while those people do their best to take care of their children. We have to help each other. And this is us helping our people. There's a, there are questions already coming in from our, from our audience and one of them relates to this, which is how is this amazing work funded? And I, is this your full-time, is this your full-time project? It's 36 hours in my day and every single last one of those hours is spent doing what I do right now. Everybody else gets 24, I get 36. That's how that works. Um, I don't have time for anything else. This is, it's not even work for me anymore. This is just my life. This is, you know, I'm so committed to changing the conditions of people in my community and changing the reality of black people in this country. I'm so committed to doing that, that it's just, it's, it's not a job. It's, it's what I breathe, it's what I eat, it's what I sleep. This is just what I do. So yeah, this is it. This is all I do all day, every day. Um, the, you know, I'm at just out here superheroing. Yeah, seriously. It, it's it, we were, before you got on um, when we were waiting for for you in the green room. Brad said, "Well, tomorrow's going to be on." I said, I, "I imagine that you're extremely busy all the time," and I'm like amazed that you may, were able to make time for this. Right now, I am in Memphis. I am preparing for uh, this is our Turkey Trot weekend where we'll, we will be passing out a thousand Thanksgiving dinners in four states. So we're road tripping. So this weekend where we have a giveaway tomorrow in Tennessee, we have one in Mississippi on Saturday. We have another one in Evansville on Sunday and then we're back to Chicago on Tuesday. And that's what we're doing right now. We're spreading the love and I mean, I, I can't think of a better thing to do right now. And I know with COVID going on, everybody's really afraid. And you have to be really careful. But I'm just, I'm telling you, people, the world doesn't stop for everybody. People are still hungry. They're still in need. And you have to show up. Somebody has to show up. I'm curious how this, if this film, if this film, and if so, how this film has helped mask and I guess that's a question for both of you, Brad and Tamar, if that's part of your goals with this film, Brad and Tamar, how you've been able to sort of take the film to bolster the work that you're doing, either through fundraising or other efforts. You know what? I mean, I'm going to be absolutely honest. I haven't done anything. It does it. It speaks for itself. I don't do anything. I log in and I show up to these things. That's what I do. And that is, and it gives me a place to talk about the work that I do and the really amazing people who helped me do it and the great work that we do. But it's like, I don't really have to do much because Brad did such a great job making this film. I mean, I couldn't tell my own story better. So like it, it, it just kind of, it does it. It's just, it works for itself. It just speaks for itself. I, I wanna, do you have anything to add? Yeah, certainly when, once I started making the film, um, and even before, I, I always envisioned that what the film would do would be to provide Tamar with a bigger platform, sort of a megaphone to help amplify her message. And I mean, that was really the goal of the film is for more people to learn about her and to see the work that she's doing and to be inspired by her to do things so that everybody can do their own thing, just like, like she does. And I feel like um, the film has so far achieved that. And, you know, like you've said, we've done a lot of these or we've been doing a lot of these. I don't know, I don't have access to, you know, what kind of donations come in uh, after we do a Q&A, but I can only assume that it goes up because yeah. people spend 90 minutes falling in love with Tamar and then they hear 
even more, you know, in these Q and A's about the work that she continues to do and how it's even more important now than it was before, if that's even possible. And uh, they want to help people. You know, Tamar has this um, this unbelievable. I don't even know what the right word is. I don't know if it's ability, but she's like a magnet and she pulls people towards her. I, I mean, I didn't, she didn't ask me to make a film about her. I basically begged her to let me make a film about her. And it's the same way people come to the block and say, how can I help you? I want to help you. And I feel like what the film is doing is, is just giving that more of an audience. True. So many of the things that you talk about in the film have become part of the national conversation in the past few months um, from, you know, criminal justice reform to food deserts to the Confederate monuments that you talk about and when you visit um, North Carolina. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, I, what if those things have become more of a conversation within mask as it's shifted in the national conversation or if the national conversation has has done anything to change no it's it's always been the part national of your conversation. conversation is not is just now starting to catch up with conversations that have been happening in black households for generations and through social media and uh, camera phones that's why this is happening but black people have been talking about this for a long time we've seen it for a long time um, the conversation hasn't changed much. The, the new conversation that we're having now is about COVID. But as far as criminal justice reform and all, it's still the same thing. Nothing was accomplished when George Floyd got killed. There was no, no real actual like legislation that came out of any real concrete policy changes or anything like that that came out of that. Nothing happened. You got some streets with Black Lives Matter painted on them and People paid attention to Juneteenth. Other, otherwise, I mean, Black people are still going to jail at a higher rate than everyone else. We're still dying from COVID at a higher rate than anyone else. And I have fifth graders who can't do timetables who don't know where Africa is when they're in eighth grade because they go to schools that don't teach them that. So there you have it. Yeah. And, and there's a moment in the film where someone asks you if you're going to go into politics. Um, I, do you see yourself sort of doing this, this kind of work within your community um, on, you know, on the streets or bringing, bringing people food, bringing people education on a person to person level um, for the foreseeable future? Or do you see yourself transitioning into a political role? Um, after the nightmare called this election that we're still living through? No, I don't want any parts of politics. Not American politics, not right now. People are too deeply entrenched in their ideas and their party and everything else. And it's getting really scary. And I wanna do real actual work. I wanna make um, meaning a meaningful difference in the lives of people in this country. And I don't think I'll be able to do that in America. I mean, in, in politics, I can't do that. I can't do the work that we'd like to do e being either blue or red. I have to just be human. I just have to be a human being. I just have to be a person. So um, maybe when I feel like I've, I've accomplished some of the goals that I'd like to accomplish. Like, it, you know, just seeing masks in different cities and seeing more schools and, you know, then maybe I'll do it. But as long as me being a D or an R can keep me from getting work done for the people, I don't want it. And how many cities is mask in now? And someone asked here, how many blocks and how many cities have you established? Um, well, we're in about six cities now. So, I mean, and it's hard to say how many blocks because everybody doesn't have blocks. Every right. city doesn't have blocks, especially um, in the South, in rural parts of the South, there are no blocks. So I don't know if it's like square mileage or something. I don't know how we would go about, you know, measuring that, but it's, in, it's, it's really starting to get around because the idea is it's so much more than just about violence now. It's about building community. And right now it looks to me like people are doing that more than ever. People are in need of establishing community more than ever right now. So um, we have people like on our block, we give out food, but everywhere in Chicago doesn't need food. That's not their problem. They don't all have, it's not, everywhere's not a food desert. So people in other areas of the city, they um, do stuff like, they do the drive for Chris Mahana Kwanzaa and collect toys and have a wrapping party and 
they do yoga together and it's you know mask yoga they do all of these things to bring their community together to create community around so we can't tell anybody how to do that but it looks different everywhere you go so i'm sorry go ahead no no go ahead so it's no way of really saying how many blocks we're on because it, it, it could be more, it could be less. I don't, I don't know how to like, you know, really figure that out. But there's a lot of us and, and, and it's becoming more and more every day. And I'm really happy about that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's something you say in the film is this, you're asking people to just take a chair outside. And, and I think the idea that people know their own communities and, they, and will get to know their own communities better mm -hmm. through these projects is such an important one. And, and, you know, it is, it's really important um, right now, too, in the age of COVID, because people are becoming so much more separated from each other. And, I mean, so much more divided because we can't see each other. We can't talk to each other. We can't be in the same room with each other. I mean, in Chicago, we can't even come out of our homes. So right now is it's the best time to have community because people are feeling really isolated right now. And the holidays are coming and people are already, it's, it's a lot of depression. It's a lot of stuff that goes on. And you don't want this season coupled with COVID, coupled with quarantine. You want community at a time like that. You want people who are going to check on you. You want people who are going to drop off groceries and ring your doorbell and call you and say, hey, I love groceries on your stoop, something like that. This is what this creates. That's the kind of America that this creates. I, I think that the idea of like, this is the season where this is happening and this is the season where this is happening comes across in the structure of your film too, the need be, sort of based on what's happening in September versus July. Um, you you sort of scheduled, you created the film around the, the calendar year, Brad. Can you talk about that choice? Yeah, well, a lot of that was uh, was a little bit forced on us because as you can see, the block undergoes a physical transformation while we're out there. So because of that, we, we kind of ha almost had to stick with a chronological timeline because you can't go back and forth and have an empty lot laid in the film when people are like, wait a minute, I thought there were benches here and there was concrete poured earlier in the film. So because of that, and just the nature of the work that starts on the first day of summer vacation in Chicago and ends on the day before school uh, is back in September. You know, that sort of seemed like the natural way to tell the story. So not only because of the, 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 the physical changes on the block, but because, you know, there's an arc, like they set up at the beginning of the summer, the summer has its rhythms, and then you build to the end of the summer Labor Day uh, block party. And then, of course, we went on afterwards with Shavuot and the trip to the Carolinas and Pesach. But essentially, the summer is when Mask does most of its work, its work outside on that block. I mean, Mask, as we know, is a full time job now. It's, it does work all year round. But for anybody who knows Chicago, once October rolls around, it gets too cold to sit outside every day. And, you know, we actually filmed uh, on Halloween and we didn't end up using any of that footage for in the film. But I vividly remember being freezing cold on that corner with, they had fire pits and I mean, it was really cold and we're talking about October 31st. So, you know, I think also part of it is because so much of the work is in the summer, that that's sort of how we decided to, to tell the story. And then of course it goes then over the summer. Uh, there's a question here about how you've been able to measure, in quotes, positive outcomes. I've been to less funerals. It's really that simple. I've been to less funerals. I've been to more graduations and um, things like that. I don't, I've been to less funerals, that's it. What other, CPD would never share that information. So that's the way that we go about, you know, measuring our, our success. And are there different measures in different cities then? Um, yeah, there are different measures. I mean, but the thing is, 
I, I don't necessarily measure what happens in other cities yet because they haven't been around long enough. So we have to give them a little bit more time to see if their approach works because sometimes you do have to tweak your approach. So I'm going to be patient and wait with them and see what happens. And if they believe that they could use the mass model to change things or to make an impact in their communities, then I'm just going to stay and watch. Let's just see what happens. There, there are a few questions coming in. Uh, one is about um, that scene where you're rejected as, it says you're rejected as a rabbinical student. Is that what happened? They were confused about that scene. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of, as, as a, being a, a woman trying to become a rabbi and, and um, what happened in that scene in the synagogue? Oh, it was by that time, I mean, I haven't been a rabbinical student for about seven years. I haven't sat in a classroom in seven years. Um, and that's just how long we've been at the stalemate about them not giving smicha to women. So sure, you can graduate, but you just can't become a rabbi. No, thank you. I don't want to do that. So um, they were supposed to, so, supposed to vote on whether or not they were going to start ordaining women. They didn't take the vote. That's what that was about. And um, I think it's around that time that honestly, I got to a point where it didn't matter much because the work didn't change. As you can see, the exact same day that we had this conversation about you not voting on, on ordaining women, I have four kids getting out of a cage in a paddy wagon. And they are, it's, it's just like, you know, this is real life for me. Me being a rabbi, I have to do my job right now. So whether you call me a rabbi or not, I just am what I am. That's it. And believe it or not, that actually was the same day. Yes. We show it in the so, film, it's the same, but it, it really was. It really helps you put things into perspective. When at 10 a.m., I'm, I'm griping about them not voting on what my title was going to be. But by 6 p.m., um, there are toddlers getting out of a police car because they, are, they, they don't have water and they're stealing water. So like, you know, when you really look at it like that, is really, is them not ordaining me really the worst thing to happen to me that day? Probably not. Right. There's a question here from Mary. Uh, thank you for your amazing work in this film. Your presence for the young people is such a touchstone. Can you speak about the scene where you bring people together on Sukkot and bringing people together of different faiths and practices? Um. I think, I mean, everybody in the neighborhood loves Sukkot. They love it. It's like everybody's favorite time of year and everybody knows when it is now. But um, it is the bringing people together all of the time that makes days like Sukkot and Pesach so great because everybody understands what's going on. And the thing is like, you know, I, I think I said in the movie, the people there aren't homeless. This is like having dinner with my family. So I include my family in my faith. Um, this is why I'm fasting. This is why I don't eat this. This is why I do this. This is why I do that. And I bring them in for that. And the thing is, like, I believe that so much of what, what anti-Semitism and racism is in this country is just us not being familiar with one another, us not being in each other's space. And the thing about it is, like, on that corner, there are Jews there a lot. And the people in the neighborhood are completely accepting of it. And we they actually have real relationships outside of the block, outside of Jewish holidays, outside of Sukkot, outside of Yom Kippur. They actually have formed relationships. But how could that have happened if I didn't put, if we didn't have a place where those relationships could happen? Because where is, um, where's a Bubby from the North Shore gonna meet uh, a kid with the rap sheet as long as your arm from the south side. Where would those two people ever come in contact? But they still find some way on that corner, they find something that they can offer one another. If, if it's advice, if it's a plate of food, if it's a drink of water, whatever it is, it's something that they can do for each other. And we build relationships around that. So it's important to create spaces where you can bring people together that are neutral spaces where you can bring people together to get to know each other. Yeah, I, I love that idea of sort of, I think 
it, it's an expansion of the idea that you you have in your mission of of creating a space within a community. But the idea of sort of bringing community community isn't just who's around the around the block from you. It, mm -hmm. It's it's much larger than that. Mm -hmm. And I guess you're doing that work also in bringing mask to different communities around the country. Yeah, yeah, and it's important for me. Um, just the places that I go to. Like here in Memphis, it's important that um, I, I often have conversations about building bridges between the black community and the Jewish community. And it's important that being black and Jewish and understanding that I am the bridge, I am actually the bridge. It's important for me to make contact with Jews in each city that I go to and invite them to these giveaways and invite them to be a part of the work that I'm doing in the black community in their city. So now, when somebody says or does something that can be perceived as anti-Semitic, you have actual people, Black people who can say, well, the Jews that I know aren't like that. So you have somebody to speak up for you. So I do my best to make sure I make introductions and I do start building those real actual bridges when I go to these places. So wherever I go, of course, I'm going to find the hood, but I'm going to find the local JCC as well. I'm going to seek out a couple synagogues. I'm going to look for some stuff like that. Because if we're really going to build bridges, I can't think of a better place to build them than on the actual ground. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Brad, when you started filming, did you know did you know what kind of scenes you would be looking for? Did you know? I mean, you said you were starting in the summer. Did you imagine doing Sukkot and a Seder? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. I knew that I wanted to document her day-to-day -day life, especially the work that she was doing on the block. But I didn't have a great sense of what that was. So my approach, in, especially in the beginning, was just sort of, let's just see what happens. You know, I showed up at Tamar's doorstep the first day, and I said, we're just going to put this microphone on your shirt, and we're going to turn on the camera. You can talk to me or not. You don't need to interact with me at all. I just want you to feel comfortable with the camera around. And, you know, we put the microphone on her and she said, let's go sit on the back porch. And she talked for like two hours just to the camera. You know, I think I asked maybe one question and she just started telling me uh, about herself, about her life and about her work. And once we finished that, she was like, okay, at some point we're going to go to the block. Let's do that. Okay, let's do that. You know, she has to get ready. We'll film you getting ready. She gets to the block. Then you have to unpack the car. Then you have to get the stuff from the house. Then you have to put the chairs out. And then you sit down. And then people show up or don't, depending on the day. So I didn't really know what to expect. But once we got into that groove, it was it was easy because every day was sort of similar. You knew that from four o'clock in the afternoon until eight o'clock at night, you were going to be on that block. And the rest of the day, you'd be preparing to be on that block. Now, whatever else was happening in tomorrow's life at any given time, that was you know what we were going to film. So I didn't have these ideas of setting things up and I want to get this. You know, certainly once I got to know Tamar well enough and once I understood who some of the players were and what some of the things that were going on were I was pushing for things like hey let's go to your temple and let's film there but again it wasn't something like we have to do it today because it's on the schedule my approach was this is Tamar's world and I'm documenting it so I'm just gonna follow her and when she says when I get to the door in the morning that she hadn't slept the night before and she had these ideas for what she wanted to do that day, then that's what we were going to do that day. And if it meant that we were going to go to uh, Hungarian kosher on the north side so she could go food shopping, then that's where we went. Uh, they didn't really love us in there with a camera. <laughs> uh, they reminded me that I should have asked for permission before we went into film and I told them they were absolutely right. but. Um, they got over it. Uh, <laughs> so really, there wasn't like an idea 
okay, we have to have this. Until, of course, we started, you know, once we had enough footage that I started thinking like, what don't I have? What do I still need? Then it's like, hey, can we possibly talk to this person? Sure. So it was never, it, we never had like shooting schedules. They didn't hand tomorrow a piece of paper at the beginning of the day and say, this is what we're doing. Oh, that I, would never work. Yeah. That would have never worked. <laughs> I figured that out really quickly and that was never my intention. So whatever Tamar said is what we did. And we just followed her with the camera. Yeah, I mean, it's it's clear in watching the film how Tamar, you're, you sort of have to shift gears immediately when the world around you changes and, and you're always um, in 12 places at once, it seems. I mean, even like you dancing at the party, but sort of dancing away to go talk to someone else. I mean, <laughs> I felt like that epitomizes what, what we'd seen through the whole movie. Um, and so much of what we see getting done is because in the beginning you talk about your right-hand man and your left hand and your son and um, and Jermaine. And, you know, there's so many incredible people who help, who help this happen. Um, and I'm curious how that works in other cities. Do people come to you and say, I want to do this? And you look for the person who can sort of fill your shoe? Because I don't think there are many of you out there in the world. No, people, you, I, I can't, I don't go anywhere we're not called, ever. Because when I go somewhere, you have to be motivated to want to do this for your community. I can't do this for you. I'm not going to be here every day. So you need somebody that's motivated to do this. And so... Normally, the person who is the, who calls me, who reaches out to us, is the me of the group. So it's like the, those are normally the people who build what will be the chapter. So um, that's pretty much how that looks there. But me, I'm always pushing. It's always, what are we going to do next? We can do better than this. We need to do something more. This is happening. So how are we going to react to it? It's always that happening. And then once I figure that out, then I share that with everybody else. But I don't necessarily expect for other people to come up with anything that's going to fix Chicago, because guess what? No one's ever come up with anything that's going to fix Chicago. So, you know, this is how this is how I do it. It's, it's constant thought. It's constant motion. I'm constantly doing something. I'm constantly thinking about what we're going to do next. How do we make it better? How do we do more? So, yeah. It, it's good that I'm the only one that gets to worry about that. Nobody else wants to never, ever, ever sleep. I'm real good at it now, though. <laughs> but I do. I think that's such an important thing to, for us all to think about. Is like sometimes it's not the questions of what what are the big picture changes we can make, but how do you actually put put food into someone's hand for one yeah. for one day? Yeah. And those things matter too. And yeah, you gotta um, start somewhere. Yeah, and that may, feeding somebody makes a difference. Um, mm -hmm. There's a question here about the title of the film um, to both to both you and to Brad about about what it means to you. They ain't ready for me. So, so I'll I'll tell the story of how we came up with the title, and then tomorrow you can talk about what it means to you. Um, it's actually a line in a Bruno Mars song, and and he says they ain't ready for me. Tamar and Kendra were dancing uh, at the 4th of July party and this song came on and when I heard this lyric I was like this is the title of the film and I walked over to Tamara and I said they ain't ready for me is what we're calling this and she's like yeah. <laughs> so what does that, it mean yeah. to you? It really means 24 karat magic is still my favorite song <laughs> but it, I mean, it really does epitomize basically my whole life. No one's ever ready for the black Jewish girl with the big mouth. No one's ever ready for that. So, I mean, I think that that was, that was pretty spot on. He has an ear. I like that he heard that. It, it's a great title. I think, though I think after watching the film, we all, at least, you know, I can, people I've spoken to also were very ready for you in terms of this. You know, people want to hear more from you, so I don't. I think, I think you at some point might need to change that title. Um, there's, there's another question. When was your first summer sitting on the block? Um, and, and I'm curious, sort of, how your relationship to this space has changed. I mean, obviously, you've built a lot more there, but um, can you talk about the relationships that you've built since that first summer? Oh, like, I mean, it's like I was born and raised there. 
like there's no there's no where I stop and the block begins. It's just like we're just that's it's part of me. I'm part of it. It's I'm I'm a part of the fiber of the of the block. So it's kind of like, you know, I know everybody and everybody knows me. And I know what's going on with everybody and everybody knows what's going on with me. And it's not a it's not something that I do so much for the block anymore. It's something that we do for the block, that the people from the block do for other people from the block. Um, we're in a place that we, we take care of each other. That's what we do. We see I mean, that in the movie. For sure. yeah. yeah. And now it's, it's just so much more like that. It's so many young people who were little kids when we started there. And their lives have taken um, a different turn than what they may have if we would have never been there. So like, it's, it's good to watch these kids grow up and become um, everything we always believed that they could be, but they might not have made it to if we'd never showed up. And MASK was founded in 2015? 2014, 2014. 2014. Mm. And that was the first summer you were fish officially out there? No. Or, no. no. Um, the first summer, I actually did something called the ABLE Project. And um, it was, instead of um, creating memorials for people who have been murdered, victims of gun violence, with you know the pictures and the flowers and the candles and the teddy bears and everything. I figured, <clears throat> I got it from um, Tubi Shabbat. It was, it was inspired by Tubi Shabbat because I grew up planting trees in Israel every year for you know a graduation, when my cousin was born, when my grandmother died, all of these different things. So I figured, why, why don't we plant trees on the spots where people have been murdered? Trees, trees that grow red leaves. And if you think about um, blood crying out from the earth, a brother's, your brother's blood cries out from the earth. It's like that everywhere in my neighborhood. It's, it's a million crime scenes and no memorials to them. You would never know any of those things happen. Once the, once the monuments are thrown in the garbage and once the rain washes the blood away, you never know that life was lost there. And I mean, I can't think of anything more sacred other than bringing a kid into the world. A soul leaving the world is sacred. And it's nothing in the ghetto. It's just like disposable. It's like, it means nothing. Something so precious. So we planted trees in these places mm -hmm. and we would let, a, let the family pick. We planted trees in parks where, you know, loved ones' favorite places were. And there was this one tree planting that we did and a kid came up to me, he was about 18 um, after we finished planting the tree. And he said, I want my tree planted right over there. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I want my tree over there because he knew he wasn't gonna live long. Wow. Wow. So he told me personally, this is where I want my tree. And I realized we're getting there too late. We're getting there too late. We have to get there on the front end. We have to keep them from becoming trees. We have to keep them on this side. So that's why the second summer didn't look like the first summer because the second summer, the first summer was more about being reactive. The second summer was more about being proactive. So that's why we stuck with that. But we still do the ABLE project, but being there, nothing beats that. Well, that's a it's an incredible story of how the how you shifted gears um, and you talk and you of course talked about the blood in the ground in the film as well and and it's such a um, I, I guess it's a biblical text but it's it's very beautiful language and I think you use a lot of beautiful language throughout the film and thank you. Um, and you also talk about trees. There's a question here about how your family ended up in Chicago from North Carolina and. I love the scene where you talk about um, feeling your roots because you said I could just be a tree with no roots. Um, what, the question is, how did your family end up in Chicago from North Carolina? Can you talk all about that? And then of course, a little bit more about your experience going back there. Have you been back since? I haven't been back since. I'm gonna probably go back in a couple months. But um, my family just, how did they get from North Carolina? I mean, you gotta remember I had four grandparents. So one grandparent didn't necessarily bring me to Chicago. North Carolina didn't necessarily get us all to Chicago. Um, Mississippi played a large role in that too. And that's why 
the South is so near and dear to me because it was the teachings of my of my grandparents, of my mother and my father. Um, they have very Southern roots that made me who I am. So it's not something that I want to forget. I understand the history of everything that happened in the South. And I mean, but my family is still here. And there was a lot of lives, a lot of lives lived, a lot of lives lost here. And I owe it to them to go back. And it's, it's kind of like I say all the time, Moses had to go back down into Egypt. Egypt didn't come to him. He had to go back down. Harriet had to go back south. Sometimes you got to go back to get your people, to bring them out. And that's what I'm doing. But North Carolina, um, my grandmother lived there until her mother gave her away. She actually gave her away at the funeral of one of the people who, whose gravestones I visited in North Carolina. And um, she moved to D.C. and she moved to Philadelphia. She lived in Philadelphia. She met my grandfather and they came to Chicago. And that's what happened. That's how that went. Um, the, there's a good question here about your next, I, I don't know if you have an answer for it, um, but what are your big goals and next steps? Everybody was just going to have to wait and see. <laughs> Believe me, it's so much better if you just wait. Just <laughs> wait for it, wait for it. It's coming. It's coming though. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Are you ready for it? <laughs> usually it's like world domination. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's what we're working on. It's going to be great. Can't wait. <laughs> and what's what's next for the film? Uh, that's a good question. So we're doing the Jewish Film Festival circuit now, and we've screened it in a bunch of different cities around the country, albeit all virtually, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, and then we're going to look for a uh, platform to share it with an even wider audience, you know, whether it's video on demand uh, or what have you. You know, unfortunately, movie theaters don't really exist anymore. So any thoughts that we may have had about screening this uh, in theaters, and we did have them, uh, just kind of disappeared. So, you know, I and I hope and I expect that uh, the, the film will continue to live on. Did you do a screening um, in your community tomorrow? For the Not yet. COVID happened. We didn't have time. I mean, this this movie literally opened like a month before COVID happened. And we had plans on bringing it to Chicago and doing a whole big thing. COVID wiped it out. But we have had virtual screenings with the Chicago JCC. Right. We actually had two. Yeah, yeah, with the Chicago JCC. Yeah, yeah we, but like people in the block, like in the hood, no. They haven't seen it yet. No. We had one, we had the premiere live, like in person at the New York Jewish Film Festival. And, and quite was, a few people from the block came to that. Though. Oh, that was amazing. Jermaine mm -hmm. came, Tamar's mm -hmm. mother came. Uh, it was incredible. Quite a few, yeah. How is good. Jermaine? We, I was thinking, I, I wanted to ask you how he's doing. Um, just, I think there's, there are, everyone in the film I sort of, you know, felt attached to after watching, so. Jermaine's great. Jermaine is actually in a car on his way here. So yes, he's fine. Well, I hope, I mean, I hope that we could get the film out to the rest of the Boston audience. I know a lot of people have watched at this festival and it is screening with the Boston Jewish Festival until November 15th, this Sunday. Um, so people watching, please tell your friends to check it out. Um, and uh, we did put more information about Mask in the chat so you can connect to all of the work that Tamara is doing and see where, where you go next. Um, it, we're expecting big things. So looking forward to seeing more your next film, Brad, and tomorrow, whatever whatever this big plan is, we, we're really looking forward to seeing it. Um, and you, there's the website again, it's ontheblock.org. So you can learn more and get, stay connected. So thank you both for joining us. Good luck on your road trip, tomorrow. Thank um, you. Thank you for wishing me luck because I sure need it. Because this is one of the most ambitious things other than sitting on the corner I've ever done. I'm gonna go sit on a corner in four cities in one weekend. Let's see how this works. Well, if you make it to Boston, you'll have to let us know. Absolutely, I will definitely let you guys know. Great. And thank you for hosting us. So glad to have you. Everyone have a very good night and we look forward to seeing you at more films throughout the week. Good night. Thank you guys, good night. <laughs>